Okay, absolutely speaking now. We've been relatively speaking. So absolutely speaking, Genesis years, as you read it in the Bible, the Genesis years are intended to be taken literally. Adam lived to be 930 years old. And the reason we draw that conclusion is because lifespans gradually got shorter as you read the history of people who, who lived. Um, Twenty generations later, Abraham died at the age of 175, which by that period of time was considered to be a good old age, an old man full of years. Well, if you're 175 today, you would be like in the Guinness Book of World Records and almost double the record or at least beat it by 50%. You know, because, um, well, people don't live that long today, but 20 generations after the first humans, the lifespans weren't like they are today, but they were considerably less than they recorded in the beginning. So one of the, one of the rationale for accepting the, inter the literal interpretation of that is because there is this progression. People's lifespans were gradually slower, uh, uh, gradually shorter. Uh, there wasn't a, 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 small, a, large, a large jump. That's found in Genesis 25, verses 7 and 8. Absolutely speaking, the stages of life for human development, though, and aging, appear to approximate the same as modern man. So again, we're talking about Abram, uh, Abraham, who lived to be 175. Even though he lived to be 175, at age 90, Abraham's wife, Sarah, had already gone through menopause. And they considered it to be a preposterous notion for Sarah to give birth at age 90. But God told the couple that it would happen by a miracle. And in fact, when we get to that part of the Bible and we start studying that, you see that Sarah laughed to scorn because I can't believe that God would even suggest that I'm going to have a child. It was just preposterous. So, so if by 90, if they live to be 175 and by 90 they've already gone through menopause, the, the lifespans were as long, but the physical development of the human body and the stages that it goes through was apparently uh, fixed to be uh, and approximated the same as uh, modern humans. So absolutely speaking, and here's the quotes, uh, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man who's a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Sarah was past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? It was just preposterous. They lived to be 175, but by 90, there's no more children. It just doesn't happen for this time period. Eve, now going back to the beginning, Eve gave birth to Seth when Adam was 130 Genesis years old. And we're not sure how many more children Adam had by Eve because the pattern holds, she would have been going through menopause. Uh, but after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. So, um, ladies, once you get to be a certain age, there's no more children, no more chance to have children. Um, but for the guys, there, there is a glass ceiling here. You can just go right through it. Uh, so there's hope for... There's hope for uh, Adam here to have many, many, potentially many more children. Um, there's lots of potential for exponential growth of the human race, the way this story is depicted, if you take it literally from the Bible. So again, many people think of Adam and Eve living in isolation, but if they live for these long periods of time and they continue to have children on into their later ages, uh, then there's uh, potential for enormous growth, um, lots of people. So let's try to understand the story of Cain and Abel and what it meant to its original readers. Well, first of all, we have to figure out who are the original readers. Well, probably Moses was the person who wrote the first five books of the Bible. It would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And this is, this is the basis for that in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. And he was referring to a specific event in that instance, but this is a commandment that Moses was supposed to write. And then at the end of his life, in the very last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the, the, the 
book where Moses uh, takes his final breath, Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from the beginning to the end. So this is, the, uh, this is actually the basis um, to, uh, to believe that Moses was not just a prophet, but also the historian that recorded these events. And they were transcribed from, uh, essentially from a, a, a verbal history, an oral history, onto the pages that we read today. So between the life of Adam and the time that he was actually written about is what we're going to look at next. Earlier we learned that there are 20 generations between Adam and Abraham. Abraham lived before Moses, um, but from Adam to Abraham, we know there's 20 generations. And a generation is many Genesis years. It's not specifically stated. Exact figures are not given, but essentially one generation, many years, and there are 20 generations. So while those details about those 20 generations and their actual spans are not all provided, we have some more details from Abraham forward, so let's look at that. Um, Abraham was 100 years old when his son was born to him. That's in Genesis 21, 5. Isaac was 60 years old. When Rebekah gave birth to them, Jacob and Esau, the twin sons, that's Genesis 25 and 6. So you add that up, 100 years from Isaac's birth to Abraham, and 60 years from Jacob's birth to Isaac, that's 160 years. Then in Genesis 47, 7 through 9, Joseph brought his father Jacob, who we just saw on the previous slide, brought his father Jacob and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh of Egypt, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are 130. This is the start of the story where the children of Israel went into Egypt and they eventually became slaves. But this happened when Jacob was 130 years old. So add that to the previous total, we're up to 290 years. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years in Exodus 1240. So add the 430 to the previous figure, we're up to 720 years. Okay, so Moses was 80 years old. Moses was 80 years old when Aaron, and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Moses was 120 years old when he died. So from the time that the people left Egypt under Moses to the time that Moses died was 120 years. Add that, this, and the subtotal here would be 760. So we've got 20 early Genesis generations plus 760 years from Abraham's birth to Moses' death. And since Moses wrote about Adam, this would be the amount of time that would actually pass between Adam's life and the time that Moses wrote it down. And there's some more information online I found um, at that address that's stated there. So the original readers were people who lived this great span of time after the events that are recorded. They were the original readers. And who were they? They're the generation that followed Moses. This was the same generation whose life began and ended under the rule of the law of Moses. We think of the Ten Commandments. And commandment number six, you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. So what was the meaning for the original readers? Well, it's reasonable to believe that the story of Cain and Abel was used to reinforce the lesson that murder was sin and God punishes man for sin. They were living under the law, and the law prescribed very stiff penalties for this type of activity. And so to have these stories available, they would have reinforced the vengeance of God. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, for example. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image God made mankind. So the penalty for murder is to be killed. Numbers 35, 33. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land. Well, that's kind of straight out of Genesis, where the blood of Abel went into the ground. 
No expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. So according to the law of Moses, the only reasonable punishment for murder was for the murderer himself to be killed. That's pretty stiff law. And of course, we've seen this picture before, and I think it kind of depicts the feeling and the sentiment that would have existed in the time. Basically, when the people of Israel who lived under the law thought of the Cain and Abel story, they, they saw a God who reigned overhead, who was delivering punishment to those who deserved punishment, who was uh, casting out and sending into exile these murderers. And basically, so this picture, I think, really depicts, this, this artwork really depicts uh, the, the sentiment of the time. The meaning of the original readers, God was wrathful, vengeful, merciless, and that sentiment prevailed for a very long time. Matthew 117 says there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to Israel's exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. So 42 more generations this feeling about the Cain and Abel story prevailed. But we have a modern interpretation of this, and this is where we want to get to today. So we did a lot. We had to go and we looked at the story, but now let's see how the New Testament and how we are supposed to look at this story. Jesus came to fulfill or complete the law of Moses. It's in Matthew 5, 17. And the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus represents a new covenant or a New Testament that supersedes the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses is still active and in force, but we live one level removed from it because our righteousness comes through Jesus and Jesus is kind of covering the basis of the Law for us. He came to complete or fulfill the Law. And as a result of this change, the interpretation of Cain and Abel necessarily needs to change also.